Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name's Kieran, for anyone who doesn't know me, um, and I'm going to be reading from the Bible tonight. Uh, tonight we'll be reading from Hebrews chapter 11, verses 8 to 16, um, and this can be found on page 1212 of the Church Bibles, um, or you can just follow along on the screen. <coughs> um, all right. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went even though he did not know where he was going. By faith he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And by faith even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful, who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised, they only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. Admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, and he has pre- for he has prepared a city for them. Um, I'd now just like to invite Andrew back up to speak with us this evening, um, and as he comes up, I'll just pray for him quickly. God, thank you for providing the time and space for us uh, to gather in fellowship tonight. Uh, I I ask that you would give Andrew wisdom as he speaks with us and communicates your word to us, uh, and hopefully shed some new perspectives for all of us here tonight, uh, and help us to listen with an open mind and an open heart, uh, so that we might be challenged and grow in our own faith and relationship with you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Kieran. Well, thanks for having me tonight. It's um, a privilege to be with you. And my sermon tonight is called, Where is Home for You? And I want you to think about this as I'm speaking tonight. I want you to think about what, is, what does it mean to have a home and where is my home when I think about that question? Where do I want my home to be? Um, some of you are younger, maybe some of you are still living in with your parents and you're thinking, what, what will it look like for me to move out into the world um, Where is home for me? Did you know that home is actually a really overarching theme in the Bible? You may never have thought about this before, but the Bible begins and ends with a garden which is home for its inhabitants. In Genesis 1 and 2, we have Adam and Eve living in the beautiful Garden of Eden. In chapter 3, they get chucked out because of their sin. Uh, But but when they were there initially, God commanded them to uh, fill the world with their progeny and to look after the creation. In Revelation, we see a garden, but this time it's in a city, presumably because there are many, many people who live there, people from every tribe and nation, people and tongue. Now, in between, the story of of home is really prevalent as well. In in, uh, Genesis 12, Abraham gets called and he gets told um, uh, to go to this promised land, which we could call home, couldn't we? In fact, the people of Israel uh, called that promised land their home and uh, still today, um, and in fact, just in recent history, uh, Israel has been re-established, hasn't it? And people have flooded from all over the world back to that that ancestral home. Uh, Of course, um, Abraham, we'll we'll see this later on uh, when we look at our passage, never actually took possession of the land, Uh, but his people, his, his descendants did. Um, But they were enslaved, remember, in Egypt, and they had to uh, flee Egypt. Um, And so we read about the exodus um, as they made their way home. And then there's the conquest of the home. And then there's the period of the judges and the kings. And sadly, Israel kept getting um, sucked into the local kind of culture, didn't they? They kept walking away from God's uh, direction and plan for them. And God had actually said, if you can't, abide 
by this covenant that I've set with you, I'll take your home away. And so sadly, towards the end of the Old Testament, we see that happen. And uh, the, the 10 northern tribes disappear forever. Um, the two southern tribes get taken off into Babylon and only a remnant return to their home. By the time we're in the New Testament, we see Jesus. Um, one of the reasons um, pe- people lost uh, their, their kind of faith in, in who Jesus was was they had this idea that the Messiah would restore home. And of course, Jesus lived in Roman-occupied Israel. And uh, people wanted a military leader who would kick the Romans out and restore Israel to its former glory. Of course, Jesus had different plans, didn't he? And he said to his people, I go to prepare a place for you. Uh, And so from there, we realise that our home is with Jesus and that Jesus is preparing that place for us as we speak. And he's going to come back one day and bring us to our home, to our eternal home. Now, I was disappointed recently when I looked up the word home in the dictionary. It basically said, a home is where you live, a dwelling place. But even Daryl Kerrigan from The Castle, you know that movie, even Daryl Kerrigan knows that a home and a house are two very, very different things. I think it's more accurate to say that a home is actually an attitude. It's a sense of connection isn't it, to a place. It's a concept for some people. For for others, it's about culture and where you feel comfortable and where you understand how things work. Um, For many people I know, they would say, wherever my family is, that's where my home is. So home is much more than bricks and mortar, isn't it? So with this sermon title, uh, Where is Home for You? I accept that there'll be a range of different answers, but it's a great thing to reflect on, isn't it? Because home is also a longing inside us. And it's something that most of us will spend a lot of energy in our lives, time, energy and resources investing in. And so anything that you spend a lot of time thinking about and energy investing in is worth um, reflecting on. Now, I've had the privilege of living in numerous houses and communities over my life. As we heard earlier, I was born in Nigeria to missionary parents And my first home was in a village of some 300 Boko people in northern Benin called Bobina. Bobina still holds a place in my heart to this day. My family and I lived in a mud hut with a grass roof. Uh, The only difference was we had a concrete floor and glass louver windows that set us apart from the other people in our village. In a Boko village, housing isn't that important. People need a place to store their stuff and somewhere to sleep that's outside of the weather. But houses get old and people need to put new grass roofs on and sometimes walls. But most living, cooking and hospitality is done outside. So you can imagine my surprise when I came to Australia. Australia is a place where houses are an obsession. In fact, we're probably more obsessed with our housing market than just about anywhere else in the world. Uh, For for many Aussies, their greatest achievement in life will be paying off a house. And for most people who buy into the housing market, their biggest expense in life will be the purchase of their property. And it doesn't end there, does it? Endless ways that you can beautify and improve your dwelling. From granite bench tops in the kitchen to the fanciest of technological solutions through the home to expansive garages and Landscape gardens is a never-ending smorgasbord of house improvements to immerse yourself in for the rest of your life. Aussies, of course, now carry some of the highest per capita debt in the world due to this love affair with property. But the Bible tells us risky business, where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, and where stock market and property markets can boom and bust and leave you flat. And the question I want to ask you tonight is, what does this love affair with property have to do with the kingdom of God? Now, I'm not here to tell you not to join the housing market, but let me tell you that I never have. That decision was made early in my marriage, and it's made me and Naomi flexible and available to serve God. It's not so much that we've never owned a house that's made us flexible, it's the fact that we've never carried any debt. Now, when I was a young adult, 
I was part of a vibrant young Christian adult community here in Melbourne. I attended Murrumbina Baptist Church, which is where I met Jeff Pugh. And I was a leader at the Monash Uni Christian Union. And I'd regularly visit Naomi at her church um, before we got married, which was at Glen Waverley Anglican Church. So I knew a lot of um, young, vibrant Christian men and women. By the time, um, sorry, during those years, uh, we went to lots of weddings. And uh, tonight we heard about an engagement. Congratulations. I was a little bit concerned when I turned around that you looked a little bit surprised. Um, I hope that wasn't a surprise to those of you getting engaged, but um, it appeared that way. Um, but over, over the, the five years, um, sorry, I went to heaps of weddings. And by the time I was 30 and had been married for about five years, um, one of the things that I realised was that most of that community of young adults had kind of just drifted, not away from the church, I think many of them still attended church, but, but what I found sad was that this passionate group of Jesus-focused young adults kind of lost that, that passion. And, and actually, as I look back, and, and at that time, I realised that very few of that group of people went on to serve God with their lives. The bulk of them, well, they got a mortgage, they got a well-paying job, they started a family. And I guess what I'm saying is that the dream of a house, a family, and a career to support it all can become all-consuming. It can also become a trap. But more on that later. So let's have a look at our passage here in Hebrews 11. And uh, Hebrews 11, of course, is a famous chapter about faith and people of faith. And we're starting at verse 8, where it talks about Abraham, by faith, was called to go to a place that he would later receive as his inheritance. And he obeyed God, and he went, even though he had no idea really where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. So Abraham went to this promised land, and we'll see later on that he never actually took possession of it, But he lived there, and he made his home there. But he made his home there like a foreigner, like a stranger. He lived in tents, it says, as did Isaac, his eldest son, and Jacob, his grandson, who were heirs with him of the same promise. Now, what's significant about living in tents is that they were kind of nomads in the land, and they moved around the land. Um, They didn't own any of the land. And and what people tended to do in the ancient world when when they owned land was to was to build a city, to put down foundations, to put a wall around it, to protect it, and to to, um, make it a a permanent settlement. It says here in verse 10, um, Abraham was looking forward to the city with foundations. But it wasn't just any city, was it? It was a city whose architect and builder is God. Now in John 14, verses 2 and 3, Jesus says to his disciples... My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you may also be where I am. So there we have this wonderful promise of Jesus, that there is a place that that he is going to prepare for us, and that he will one day bring us back. And I love that phrase where um, he says, uh, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. It's kind of saying the same thing twice, but it really affirms, doesn't it, that, that our home, our place is with Jesus and he longs to bring us to that place so that we can be with him. Continuing in our passage, it says, by faith, even Sarah who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children. Why? Because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so we see Abraham trusting God. We see Sarah trusting God. And, uh, and even though they were well past uh, the age of, of having a family, God gave them um, Isaac. And then verse 12 says, And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, And as countless as the sand on the seashore, God was faithful. God um, promised and he met his promise. Now, when I was living in Tanzania, um, I became aware there was something that I was missing, but I 
couldn't put my finger on it. I was very aware that I was missing family and friends here in Australia. I was aware that I was missing certain infrastructure that, that we take for granted when we're here, but um, it makes things work. It makes our lives easy. And then one day, I realised what it was that I was missing. I was missing Melbourne, the place. It might sound strange, but I miss the cloud formations in Melbourne. In Dodoma, where we were living in Tanzania, there's eight months of the year where it doesn't rain a drop, and the sky is blue every day. Sounds beautiful, doesn't it? Oh, I really miss the clouds, and I miss the beautiful formations we get, and the sunset, and the sunrise, and the way the clouds play a role in that. I miss driving in the country, maybe because some of the Tanzanian roads were pretty horrendous. I miss the, the vibe. I know I sound like um, someone out of the castle now, but I miss the vibe that is Melbourne. And it's a vibe that you most likely are not aware of until you leave. I was talking to a friend of mine this week about, um, about this sermon and, and preparing for it, and he said to me, you know, Qantas, our national airline carrier, doesn't market trips overseas. I, I've never kind of thought about this before, but he said, you know, they market the concept of bringing Aussies home. Isn't that right? Um, with that theme song, I still call Australia home. And uh, no matter where you've been, no matter what wonders you've seen and done, it's always wonderful, isn't it, to come home. And that, that's how Qantas kind of markets their, their service. Now, another way to define home is that it's a longing within us. Maybe that's what I was struggling with in Tanzania. I couldn't quite put my finger on it and then suddenly realised there was this longing for this place. Now, each of us humans, we live with a whole range of longings and I think our longing for home is, is so deep that sometimes we struggle to articulate it. Now, C.S. Lewis, in his sermon, The Weight of Glory, uh, had a go at doing this and he said, and I quote, these things, the beauty of the world, the memory of, the memory of our own past are good images of what we really desire. But if they're mistaken for the thing itself, that is the thing that we long for, they turn into dumb idols, breaking the heart of their worshippers. For they're not the thing itself. They are only the scent of a flower we've not found, the echo of a tune we've not heard, news from a country that we've never yet visited. Lewis says, you and I need to be woken from the evil enchantment of worldliness that has been laid upon us. Almost our whole education has been directed to silencing this shy, persistent inner voice. Almost all our modern philosophies have been devised to convince us that the good of man is to be found right here on this earth. So you see, I'm not saying that home on earth is a bad thing. Home is this longing inside us. What we need to be really careful to do is to make sure that we don't mistake our earthly homes for the true home that we long for. If you do so, your earthly home will become an idol that will eventually break your heart when you can't extract from it all the things that you were longing for. Let's go back to our passage. Verse 13 says, all these people, so Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, they were still living by faith when they died. That's amazing, isn't it? They, they had been promised something and they never in this life took hold of it. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. Now, my question to you is, when you think about your citizenship, where do you belong? Now, if you say, well, I'm an Australian, I'm a Melbourneian, this is my place, this is where I belong, then you're not a foreigner or a stranger, you're a citizen. Even though Abraham lived and made his home in that promised land, he always said that he was not a, foreign, that he was not a citizen. He, he admitted that he was a foreigner and a stranger. And verse 14 says, people who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. So when you say, you know what, I live here, I love it here, but this isn't my home, 
What that says to other people is that there's somewhere else that is your home. There's somewhere else that meets that longing in your heart. That right now, while you might be here, you're actually a foreigner here. You're an alien in this land, and there's somewhere else that you belong to. That's powerful, isn't it? And that's um, how Abraham and his family saw that land. Verse 15 says, if they'd been thinking of, of the country they'd left, now they'd, they'd left a place called Haran in Ur, if they had been longing for Haran, they could have gone back. Instead, it says, verse 16, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. So God asks of us, he asked of Abraham and his family to believe him, to, to have faith in his promise. And therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God and he will meet their need with a, a city that he's prepared for them. Now, I want to speak with you briefly about the holy life. And then I want to take a few minutes to practically outline what's involved in serving God, particularly overseas as this is May Missions Month, but also I'll talk a bit about um, how you could serve God right here. Now, a preacher I heard recently said that the good news of Jesus sometimes is seen as, as kind of the best part of the gospel, of the Bible. You know, he said it might be thought of like the four weeks of annual leave that you get. And he said, while the holy life is the grind that we participate during the other 48 weeks of the year. He said the gospel might be seen as a rich dessert, while the holy life were the boiled potatoes that you ate in the main course. But he went on to say that's not the case, is it? The reality is that the holy life that God calls us to, every one of us, not just professional clergy, every one of us is called to live the holy life. And that is the rich result of the gospel. God saved us from our sin through Jesus' atoning death on the cross. And then he saves us from the drudgery and boredom of a meaningless life. Now, I spend uh, my life uh, working in the corporate sector, doing leadership development work and uh, coaching, training work. And I meet people all the time who are struggling with, with the meaninglessness of what they do, with a sense of there's got to be more than this. And this is in a place where we are among the, the world's richest people. So if the world's richest, most affluent people are bored and feel a lack of purpose and meaning, then let me tell you, what the world is selling to you doesn't work. And so this brings us back to the theme of home. And my question to you tonight is, where are you investing yourself? And where are you going to invest yourself in the future? Will you spend the rest of your life accumulating property and other assets because that's what the world encourages you to do? Or will you, like many faithful men and women before us, live in this world like a stranger in a foreign country? What could that life look like? Well, let me get you started on that journey. I've got a PowerPoint, but uh, there we go. Um, so we're going to just think about this. And I know it says overseas, but I want you to also think about the fact that you could do this right here in, in Australia. Australia, on, a, on the globe, is actually a really dark spiritual place. And Melbourne is perhaps one of the darker spiritual places in an already dark spiritual place. So right here in Melbourne, there is a deep need for mission to be taking place. Uh, there are communities of people here in Melbourne who've never heard the good news of Jesus. So you don't need to be going overseas. Um, I often think it's ironic that we send um, missionaries overseas when right here on our doorstep, we have, whoops, we have a dark reality. Um, I don't know who I wave at, but next slide, please. Um, so you can see a number of bullet points here, and I'm just going to run through these bullet points in a series of slides, and we're just going to look at um, what are some things that I might consider as I think about what it would look like to serve God overseas. <clears throat> now, some of you will be on this journey already. And let me just encourage you to, to keep on that journey. Others of you, you might be thinking, what does it look like? How do I do it? Um, sometimes when we meet people who have served overseas for many years, 
um, we kind of, they, they feel like a different breed. And you think what they do and who I am are two very different things. I could never do that. Um, but worth exploring. Next slide. The first thing I want to say is that there is a million and one opportunities out there in the world today. Um, perhaps there's more opportunities now than there's ever been. And God can use you in your professional capacity. So if you've studied to be an accountant, a lawyer, a doctor, a nurse, a teacher, um, whatever you've studied to do, a builder, you could do that um, in mission for God. Um, you can see business's mission there, bam. Um, I talked a little bit about that earlier, this idea of um, uh, the combination of business and, and gospel ministry. Um, there's also a thing called PAM, which is professionals as ministry. This is where people um, might take up a job, for example, a lecturer going to um, work in a, in a university somewhere overseas and uh, being part of the faculty there, but also being there very intentionally as a Christian witness. Um, it might be a consultant going to work for KPMG in, in Tanzania and serving in that kind of um, role. So there's lots of people who find themselves as professionals in mission in, an, in a secular organisation as a Christian um, serving in that place. Um, many different um, countries where mission is happening require um, administrators to go. Uh, it doesn't sound really sexy, but you know what? It's absolutely essential. And organisations that I work with and know well um, or I often struggle to find people who are willing to go and actually um, make mission possible on the ground for the teams that are working there. And, of course, if you've got leadership experience or um, you've been a team leader, um, nowadays a lot of mission happens in teams and there's always a need for leadership, particularly in multi-ethnic teams, um, multicultural teams. It's often a really complex role um, that needs wise leadership. Um, most of the time now when, when people go overseas, they don't go overseas and plant churches. They work with national leaders to plant churches. And so once upon a time when there was no church, Westerners would do that. Nowadays, often um, we're working alongside local people and serving them in the way that we do that. You can see some other examples there. Next slide, please. This slide just talks a bit about family and risk. And I, I mentioned there that it's not just as a family, but even as a single, um, you have to think about a whole lot of different logistics. Um, there are a whole lot of costs involved. Um, even where it says visas there, that can be very challenging. Um, getting into Tanzania now, for example, is, is almost impossible for a missionary, whereas once upon a time, uh, you, could, you could literally have missionaries stamped in your passport and go in. Um, and so we have to be more kind of creative, and it has to be authentic. You can't be sneaking into countries pretending to be something that you're not. Um, that actually brings the gospel into disrepute. Um, you need to know when you get to a country that there are um, the services that are going to be able to look after you if things go wrong. Um, we went with SIM to Tanzania and we knew that if something went horribly wrong, which thank God it didn't, that we could, could organise an emergency evacuation and we could get out of there quickly and we could get to um, the right kind of care. Schooling is often a real challenge. Um, we, when we went to Tanzania, our kids were able to go to a local international school, um, but that international school really started failing badly in the kind of second or third year we were there, and we ended up having to come home um, a little bit early um, because that school became unviable, and the other schools, international schools in the country, were horrendously expensive, and we realised that we, we, uh, we needed to come back for the sake of our children. There's also questions of safety, both physical safety but also psychological safety and the impact of um, mission work on your children. It can be a great adventure. It can also be a great challenge. And so being aware of those things and being prepared for them is critical. Next slide. Choosing a mission agency is a challenge. There are so many different mission agencies and I've tried to put some bullet points here in order of, of uh, kind of priority. I think the first priority is you need to know that you and the mission agency that you're potentially thinking of joining uh, are really well aligned theologically and also aligned in terms of mission, vision, values. Um, most organisations will put you through a really rigorous application process and want to get to know you and get to know what you stand for and, and get to know what kind of faith you have. Sometimes the ministry role that you want to play will dictate the agency that you join. 
sometimes the region of the world that you feel called to, or maybe you already have some language or you have an affinity, um, that uh, there are certain organisations that do particular work in particular places. Um, the question there of, of faith-based is really about support. Um, some organisations will require you to raise um, whatever money you need to support you in the field. Um, some organisations will be able to provide you with a small salary. Um, others, maybe you go out and you do a voluntary role for a period of time. I mentioned most mission agencies now are team-based in their ministry, which means you have people around you to look after you and care for you as well as to serve with you. Um, and then, of course, there's a whole range of institutions that people uh, join. So depending on your profession, um, you might like to find an organisation that runs certain institutions like schools, hospitals, universities, etc. And it's really important to know how well will I be cared for by this organisation? Um, what are the pastoral care kind of structures that are in place? Next slide. Uh, this slide is a good idea for anyone, no matter where you live, and it's really about developing good, healthy, spiritual, physical and emotional disciplines in your life. And uh, particularly if you're going overseas, because transition to a new culture, to a new context, is exhausting. And uh, we know that lots of missionaries actually burn out, particularly in the, in the early years of their, their life, because everything's so new and different and challenging. Um, and so having a real plan to manage yourself, having intentional breaks, having a strategy and having a coach can be a really helpful thing to um, help you, particularly getting through those first few years. Next slide. Nowadays, there's lots of really great training available, um, training which probably wasn't available to my parents, but which is available um, to you. Um, and so learning how to cross culture. Um, with cultural intelligence training, uh, that second bullet point, you can do an assessment and discover, you know, what are my aptitudes and where do I need to develop in order to be able to cross culture really effectively. Um, transition is a huge thing. You know, when you move to a different country, you move house, you move culture, you're eating new food, you're learning a new language, you're using a new currency, everything changes. And that in itself can be really quite exhausting. And so having people to walk that journey with you are really, is really critical. And that last bullet point about re-entry, um, that's an interesting thing, isn't it? That often uh, when you, you expect when you go to another country that you're going to be confronted by um, a whole lot of new realities, but you don't necessarily expect when you come home that it's going to be tough. And so a lot of people kind of get surprised by that. And we talk about reverse culture shock. And so um, re-entry preparation is, is uh, something that, that organisations are doing much more thoughtfully now. And then we have financial support and preparation. Now, the top couple of bullet points there bring us a little back, bit back to the sermon and to the themes I, I was raising. And, and I want to ask you, what kind of financial condition are you in now? Taking on debt, the simple reality is it will inhibit you from serving God. Um, you will be locked into um, a, a, a career that, that will require you to be able to pay that debt back. Learning to save and, within your, and live within your means is a great thing to do. And you know what? It's completely countercultural to the way most Aussies live. Um, most Aussies, you just live it up and you worry about paying for it tomorrow and you're locked in for the next 30 years or however long it's going to take and you don't really ever have time to, to think about how you might serve God. The bullet points below that just talk about raising financial support, which is a huge challenge. Um, you know, going to people talking to them, asking them to raise, um, to actually support you financially. Um, you have to have um, a vision and a mission uh, and a, a credible story that people can see that what you're doing is genuine and it's going to make a real impact. And then when you're in that role, you have to be really transparent about your finances. Now, think about our culture. We don't talk about how much we earn. We don't talk about our assets. We don't talk about our budgets um, with each other. Um, it's kind of not the thing to do in our culture, but uh, when you're a missionary, people want to know, you know, what do you need? How much do you need? Have you got enough? Um, have you got too much? And the bottom question there says, um, be careful not to under budget. Um, I've met people who are so eager to get out to the field, they set a budget target, which is low, so they can get out quicker, but then they discover when they get there that they haven't got enough to live on. And that can be 
um, painful and, and very difficult to rectify once you're in the field. So um, be really sensible, get the advice you need and then raise your funds and know that, that God will provide your needs. Final slide here is about timelines and that's just to say that getting from here to there takes time. I mentioned at the very start of this that some of you will be well onto this journey already. Um, you will have um, a, 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 an education. You'll have a tertiary degree. You might have some years of experience in your field. That's a wonderful thing. Um, a lot of people want to get some theological study under their belt before they go overseas so that they can be adept at teaching people the good news of Jesus and discipling people and being able to share the Bible with them. Uh, the process of application to an organisation can take 12 months in and of itself. Uh, and then, of course, all the finance and support raising, saying goodbye, um, induction, language, culture ac acquisition. Um, some people might do this quite quickly, which would be 12 to 18 months. That would be really fast. Other people, this can take five to ten years, uh, depending on how much of that education and experience piece they need to get. So, guys, there's a whole lot of uh, information um, if you kind of ever wondered, how do I get from here to there? What does that look like? Hopefully that's given you some ideas. But let me pray and then uh, we'll close up. Father, we thank you that not only do you save us through the death of Jesus on the cross, not only do we, uh, are we given the free gift of eternal life, but you also include us in mission. You include us in your plan to reach the world and to reach men and women all over this planet who've never heard the good news of Jesus. And we pray that you would uh, engage us joyfully and with, with enthusiasm into that mission. Father, I pray for each person here that you would uh, be speaking to their hearts, help them to know their gifts that you've given them and help them to find their niche in your kingdom. I pray this in the power of Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much to Andrew. We're going to